Um, hey, folks, I'm, I know people are still filtering in, but I'm, I want to get started because uh, I have a lot to cover in 20 minutes. Um, I am humbled by the, uh, the uh, presence of so many August members of our community in this room, so I just have to say thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Skylar Earle. Uh, I'm here to present a gazetteer for the Library of Congress. Uh, so first, what is a gazetteer? Um, it's a, according to Wikipedia, it's a geographic, oh sorry, this is Wiktionary rather. Uh, it's a geographic dictionary or encyclopedia, sometimes found as an index to an atlas. In other words, it's a great big list of places. Um, so the Library of Congress has a, a very large quantity of bibliographic metadata. Um, as you know, they're one of the largest libraries in the country. Um, and so they have a, an enormous card catalog, which has been evolving over the years. Now it's mostly in digital format. But, uh, but over the decades, the library of, has, has uh, accumulated just this incredible amount of metadata. Some of it is geographic, um, and it's all basically unstructured, right? So, uh, and a lot of it is historical. So, so some of the places that are referred to in metadata uh, don't exist anymore. Uh, some of them are not actual places, uh, incorporated places as we think of them. So there are a lot of challenges for the library in terms of how to manage the metadata that they have about books and media as regards place um, and how to uh, keep that updated and how to constantly improve it for the future. So um, they like to call this geographic metadata remediation, which is a mouthful, but basically it means taking the metadata that they have about books Right, uh, you guys all know what I mean about metadata, right? Like all the information that they have about the book, like where it was published, who wrote it, uh, what are the topics that it's about, and so on. Uh, and so uh, they want to take all of the, the metadata that they have about, ultimately, about all of their holdings across the entire library um, and try to improve the quality of the geographic information that's associated with that metadata. Um, and this is an ongoing effort. Um, uh, I'm here as a representative of Topomancy LLC. Uh, my colleagues Tim and Sanjay are here in the audience. Um, and hello to Shekar and any of our other colleagues who are watching the live stream. Um, and so we were brought in by the library almost four years ago uh, to consult with them on a pilot project that they were doing uh, on a very small collection uh, to try to work out better ways of improving the quality of the geographic information that they have in their metadata. Um, and specifically trying to add structure to it so that it can be used as um, you know, for, for uh, geographic search uh, and used for faceted search and so on. Um, and so uh, it, we, after doing this pilot with them, we, we basically told them, look, if you're going to try to turn your geographic metadata into a structured form, you need to have an authoritative list of places. Uh, and the library has maintained this thing called uh, authority files. They have these things called authority records. And they have an authority record is essentially a, a, a concrete reference to a named entity that they have. And the authority files uh, refer to people and things and places and ideas, topics, et cetera. Um, and so they have these geographic authority records. But what's interesting is that they have no centralized listing, or at least they didn't used to have a centralized listing of authority records. So there's nothing really authoritative about them. Uh, and then there's no, for the geographic authority records, there's in most cases no geographic information, no actual coordinates associated with any of them, just names of places. So not terribly useful. Uh, so we said, you need uh, uh, an authoritative list of places, or in other words, a gazetteer. Uh, so we decided, so we set about, uh, uh, last year we built a, a prototype based on this idea for the library, and they liked it so much, they decided to buy the whole thing. Uh, so this, uh, this past year, uh, Tim and Sanjay and I and Shekhar uh, Krishnan and our colleagues at the library have together been building uh, a full-on version of, a global version of a gazetteer of places so that the library can use it to remediate their geographic metadata. So we, we started with a very simple data model. Um, every place in the gazetteer has three core properties. That's a name, a place type, and a geometry. Um, we also include alternate names, including the orig original language of the name and uh, in some cases the usage, so like historical names, um, colloquial names and so on are captured this way. Uh, we try to capture the administrative hierarchy of a place, right, which is to say, you know, what country is this place in, what province is it in, and so on. Because this is meant to be a gazetteer of both contemporary and historical places, we also capture the time frame. We capture relations between places, and this is partly um, when two places, when the same place comes from two data sources, how do we identify that they are the same? We call this conflation. Um, and then we also have relations between places, uh, both geographically and over time. So when the city of Brooklyn becomes part of the city of New York. We want to be able to capture that relationship uh, between Brooklyn and New York as it becomes part of the other. 
Um, and then of course we also, because this is a tool that we want the library to be able to curate, we want them to be able to edit it, we want them to be able to maintain it over time and improve it over time, uh, we also capture the edit history of every object. So just like OpenStreetMap, just like Wikipedia, uh, because this project is, is designed to be a kind of a crowdsourced database of information, where in this case the crowd is just the staff at the library to start with, uh, then we also capture the edit history. So we have a way of tracking changes over time to individual records and, uh, and being able to roll back when mistakes get made. Uh, so, simple you say, simple. Well, so this is the thing is every single one of these simple aspects of our data model is actually incredibly fraught, right? So you say like, oh, you have a, a place, right? Well, which name do you use, right? If a place has multiple names, um, and particularly if you have multiple records that describe the same place from different sources, how do you choose between them? Um, have you ever seen a good place taxonomy? Right, this simple idea of, oh, a place has a type. Well, what the hell does that even mean? Now, OpenStreetMap, as you probably know, started many years ago and said like, well, we're just gonna have key value pairs and that's how we're gonna address the problem of typing places. And it, it turns out, I, at the time, I was like, that's a terrible idea and it'll never work. And I was absolutely wrong. Um, and I'm pleased to say that. So OSM has kind of tackled this problem by building a sort of ad hoc taxonomy from the ground up. Um, but if you've ever tried to build a taxonomy of place from the top down, you, it turns out to be intensely difficult. It may even be impossible. Um, then the question of geometry, oh, very simple. Is this a point, is it a polygon? What's the scale of the polygon? I and mean, this actually wind up uh, being a, an issue for us later on. Um, have you ever seen a, global, a detailed global admin data set? You try to build a hierarchy of uh, geographic places. It turns out to be really difficult because in many cases the data is not just, just not there, even in OSM. Um, uh, so time frames, right? Time frames are actually this really crazy thing where you can say like, oh, Rome was built around 1000 BC and then it was sacked by the, the Visigoths on this exact day, right? And so these this time frames have this huge ambiguity, both with their start and their ending. They could be, the times could be spread across, you know, the 1880s, the mid-19th century, yesterday afternoon around lunchtime. Um, and then we have this, this idea of relationships. I kind of alluded to this earlier. Like it turns out that trying to describe ge uh, spatiotemporal relationships between places and getting the semantics exactly right is also uh, can, can, is a rabbit hole that you can go down. Um, and I think that every single one of these topics is actually like a, a doctoral dissertation for some geography student. So we tried to pull together as many free and open data sources to build into our gazetteer as possible. Um, so of course we started with OpenStreetMap and with GeoNames. Uh, and then we also included uh, TigerLine. Uh, we use natural earth data. Um, and we also uh, pulled in a bunch of other smaller data sets like the uh, historical marker database, the national historical GIS, which has uh, states and counties for every decade going back to the found foundation of our country. Uh, uh, the National Registry of Historic Places from the National Park Service. And of course, the Library of Congress's vaunted authority records. Uh, and so in some cases, the challenge for us was to try to identify where, when an authority record matches a place that we can find in OSM uh, or GeoNames, or can we extract from the very poorly structured uh, uh, properties of that r authority record. Sometimes there's geographic information in there, which itself may have come from geonames or something like that. So you're probably wondering, why are we not just using OpenStreetMap? Well, so first off, as you probably know, OSM does not have permanent identifiers for anything. Uh, which is one of the requirements of this project. Uh, there is no real support yet for uh, historical places in OpenStreetMap, uh, although there is the Open Historical Map project, which is just, I think, starting to get traction. Um, and then uh, there's concerns about like data imports and colloquial places. We wanted to use kind of more data sets than just OSM, and there's some concern about like importing that data into OSM. Um, and then there are colloquial places. One of the canonical examples that the Library of Congress has is they have a lot of books about the South, like the American South, right? Like how do you point to, oh, this is the place that is the American South. Like there's nothing, you wouldn't really put that in OpenStreetMap. It doesn't have a physical reality, but it does have a reality that we can understand, you know, both socially and culturally. Um, and also OSM is kind of a little bit too hard on librarians, to be totally fair. I mean, it's OpenStreetMap, getting into OpenStreetMap and really using it can be quite difficult, as you probably know. And so we wanted to kind of insulate them from some of the complexity of OSM by using OSM data without requiring them to learn and understand OpenStreetMap. Uh, so the technical architecture, uh, we use Django on the back end. Uh, the kind of primary, the kernel, the core of this application is a, a JSON API. Uh, we use uh, Backbone, is that right, Backbone? To talk to, uh, to talk to that JSON API and provide a front end. Um, we use Elasticsearch on the back end, actually as a document store. Uh, you know, Elasticsearch was originally designed as a search engine, but it actually makes a really great NoSQL document store. Um, and its text search is pretty fantastic. I'm, I'm super bullish on Elasticsearch. It's, it's really worked out well for us. And then of course we're using PostGIS, um, partly to store like application parameters. Um, and also as a repository of administrative boundaries um, because as you probably are aware, it's easier to do certain geographic uh, geometric operations in PostGIS.
So uh, importing OpenStreetMap data into the project, trying to map OSM to our supposedly simple data model, um, was uh, quite an interesting process, as you can imagine. Um, so uh, these are the tags that we mapped in uh, using OSM to PGS. We I tried a bunch of different things. Like I tried using Osmium. Uh, my process kept running out of memory on like an uh, uh, EC2 quad extra large. Like uh, just craziness. So finally, it turns out it seemed insane to import all of the OSM data that we wanted into uh, post GIS and then export it to Elasticsearch. But that wound up actually being the best way to do it. So we looked for. Uh, places that had all of these tags, except that I wanted to make some of these tags optional in some, or make a place optional if it had a tag, which is to say uh, the way that OSM to PGSQL works, if you have a custom style and you say like, oh, uh, if, if you see these tags, then we want this place in, imported into PostgreSQL. Well, I didn't want absolutely everywhere that had a name. Right, we only wanted the, the, the places, right, the points and the polygons. And the other thing is, of course, we're not importing any streets, um, which is one of probably the largest single item highways, probably the largest single type of item in uh, OpenStreetMap. We're not using them at all. So we're just looking for places that you can kind of point to and say, like, oh, this is a landmark or uh, this is a, an incorporated place um, and so on. Um, so we used OSM to PGSQL to bring the data into Postgres uh, uh, this way. Uh, we used uh, the HStore. Uh, facility to, to make to get all of the names. Uh, this is quite cool. I got I can't say enough good things about us on the PGSQL. Uh, so then uh, then once we got the data into PostGIS, we read the nodes and nodes and, and ways the, the polygons out of it. We kept the ones that had names. We mapped the tags to our to the GeoNames taxonomy. So we decided for the purposes of the gazetteer to use the GeoNames taxonomy, which has its pros and its cons. Um, we, uh, we then compute the centroids of each place, we collect the alternate names, we transliterate names into Latin script to make it possible to search for them uh, in English, um, where their places don't have English names. Uh, we create persistent IDs, and then we dump everything to JSON and then load it back up into Elasticsearch. So it's just something of a process, and it takes actually many hours to run, but the result is that we have this kind of nice, relatively clean data set derived from OpenStreetMap uh, that, that uh, maps into our very simple library data model. Uh, and then we did similar things for uh, GeoNames and for you know the other data sets, most of which came in shapefile format. Um, but OpenStreetMap was by far the most complicated. Uh, well, also loading up the, the LC authority records was complicated too, but for reasons I won't go into. Um, okay, so the taxonomy that we used, right? So I was saying place typing is really hard. Uh, GeoNames has a, a, a taxonomy that was derived from the G, uh, GNIS, which is the, the Board of Geographic Names, U.S. Geological Survey's kind of official taxonomy of place types, which is already a pretty woolly bear. Uh, and then on top of that, they squeezed in uh, the place types, I think, from the GeoNet Name Service, which is an international data set originally from the uh, uh, NG NGA. Um, and then since then, the GeoNames maintainer has been just kind of randomly adding new place types on top of that. So it's just complex thing. Uh, and then, of course, as you know, OpenStreetMap has, functionally speaking, thousands of types. Um, but there's this very long tail, right? Where you can actually, the, the first 500 types, uh, like the most 500 commonly used tags in OpenStreetMap represent uh, the overwhelming majority of places uh, in OSM. So we wound up mapping them manually, uh, which took hours in a spreadsheet. It was a huge pain in the ass, but it, it worked. Um, I experimented with doing a little bit of sort of paid crowdsourcing using a company called Crowdflower. Um, but it's hard to build a user interface where you're like, I have thousands of things, and I want you to pick the one of the 600 things over here that maps to this stuff. It's, it, it's hard, right? Crowdsourcing, it turns out, is actually really difficult. So you give yourself a pat on the back if you've contributed to OSM because you've done something that's really hard. Um, so this is kind of how we wound up mapping the place types. Uh, this is, we also had to deal with admin levels because as you know, OpenStreetMap has a somewhat idiosyncratic way of describing administrative hierarchies in terms of level. Um, and there's a good reason for that, uh, which is to say every country has a kind of a differently scaled administrative hierarchy. Uh, but we had to handle that also. And this is also kind of a shot in the dark, like mapping OpenStreetMap, trying to globally map OpenStreetMap uh, uh, admin levels to something that looked like GeoNames is, uh, uh, it ran kind of not random, but you know, tricky. So then we also had to build the admin. I only have like five minutes left, don't I? <sighs> Rats. Okay. Um, then we had to build the uh, the admin hierarchy for every single place because we want this to appear in the search results, right? Like if you're looking at uh, Springfield, which Springfield is it? So you want to be able to see that. So we loaded natural earth data into PostGIS. 
um, and did like point and polygon or centroid and polygon hierarchies. Um, there are some problems due to scale because uh, as Nathaniel will be the first to tell us, natural earth data is not a, a highly detailed geographic data set. It's designed for cartography and it does really well at that. But there is actually no other freely available source, as far as I know, of global, uh, international, and provincial boundaries. So uh, we did the best we could with this, but where, where you get places that are near borders, sometimes they get uh, kind of geotagged into the wrong place or geocoded into the wrong place. So better data sets are needed, but here lies danger because, oh, I don't know, India and Pakistan or Cyprus or Israel and Palestine. God help you if you try to make a, an authoritative data set of international boundaries. Um, okay, so uh, this is the Digital Library of Congress Digital Gazetteer. Uh, I'm gonna see if I can give you a working demo. Um, so cross your fingers, everyone. Uh, so I'll just type in, uh, I was gonna type in Liberty Bell, but let's say Statue of Liberty. So eh, let's think about it for a minute. And this actually, when you consider that we're searching 13 million places in Elasticsearch, this actually, I'm really satisfied with these results. Uh, so then we can kind of zoom in and look at clusters of these places here. Um, so as you can see, there's a whole bunch of them down in, uh, um, in New York Harbor. And so we get, you know, uh, Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty National Monument. Building the Statue of Liberty is a historical site. It's a historical marker. Cornerstone of the Statue of Liberty pedestal. So um, as you can see, this is actually like this is a huge wealth of places in here. Um, and as you can see, they're not really well ordered in the current output. This is a thing that we're, we're still working on. So this project is still in progress, I should mention. Um, and it's going to be continuing for another few weeks. And there are a few details that we still have to, pardon me, iron out. Uh, but as you can see, we can search for um, every kind of place uh, if we wanted to find, uh, for example, a monument um, and only show those, uh, then we can do that. And we rerun the search. And you can see we just get the one Statue of Liberty. Um, if we want to, we can look at different sources um, and so on and so forth. So uh, then if we want to drill down, oh, that's right, that user interface is still, um, in the process, it's still a work in progress. Um, as you can see, we have alternate names. Um, this is, so this comes from GeoNames. We get, uh, oh boy, like you can see we've got uh, Estatua de la Libertad. Like this is, this is pretty cool, right? Um, uh, we can look at the administrative boundary so we know it's part of New York State. Um, we have a revision history. We can look at the, like this data is all stored in JSON. There's a JSON API. Um, and then we can look at the relations between the Statue of Liberty and other places which we don't currently have. Um, and another thing we can do, and another thing um, is we can look at, for example, uh, we can do uh, geographic search, uh, sorry, historical search, and we can look at um, New York between 1700 and 1776. We actually might not get anything. I should probably expand that a little bit. Um, this should work, right? In the historical search. All right. Um, well, anyway, in the interest of time, I'll move on. But anyways, but you get the basic idea, right? Like we've got all this data in here. Um, it's editable, like it's possible like to log in and to edit these places and so on. Um, so this is very exciting. Uh, and, it's, and it's simple, right? Like it's, 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 uh, it's kind of a thing that, that an ordinary human being and not the, the godlike beings that st sit before me. Like is something an ordinary human being can get their heads around. So we, we feel like we've really tried to you know, drill down and, and get the kind of essential nature of what it means to have or, or to make a gazetteer. Uh, am I over time? Oh, I have 10 minutes still, really? Oh, awesome, okay. Um, Wow, all right, cool. Um, uh, one of our previous flagship projects was uh, the New York Public Library Map Warper, uh, which was the brainchild of Tim Waters um, some years ago. And uh, it's an open source project. Uh, the New York Public Library uh, contracted Topomancy to, uh, to customize it for use by the, the New York Public Library's map library. Uh, and they have a collection of literally like 100,000 like printed maps. Uh, which they've been gradually scanning into their digital archive. And so uh, um, together, uh, we took Tim's tool and uh, built it into a thing where the library can sort of crowdsource the georectification of these maps so they can be draped over top of contemporary maps or over top of other historical maps. And so uh, NYPL, when they found out we were building a gazetteer for the Library of Congress, they were like, ooh, we want one too. Um, but what's interesting about NYPL is that, is that where the Library of Congress um, has a kind of a global scale where they're trying to remediate metadata about books that could be anywhere in the world, the New York Public Library's main focus is New York. And, uh, and so they're more interested in kind of drilling down really deep and, 
kind of finding individual buildings and individual street addresses in New York City and tying their collections to 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 that, right? So uh, they have a level of detail, a kind of a, a, a kind of fine grain. Uh, to what they want to do, which presented us with a really fascinating challenge. Um, we wound up having to modify, for example, uh, modify our data model to include street address. The Library of Congress doesn't care about that, but NYPL does. Uh, so, uh, so that's quite cool. Um, and we've been working on this on this project in, in tandem with both organizations, um, and sort of benefiting from the contributions of each one. Um, so there are some some challenges that are still kind of ongoing with these projects, which we have to kind of tie up with a bow. Uh, very shortly. Uh, there's the issue of conflation, like trying to, conflation is broadly speaking, like if you have multiple data sets, right, multiple geographic data sets um, you're, uh, that are of the same place, you're likely to find that there are places within those data sets that are the same, right? Like you have New York City, for example, is both in OpenStreetMap and in GeoNames and likely to be in other data sets. How do we find those records in those data sets and say these places are the same? Right? Because the, the consequence, if you don't do this, then your gazetteer is going to return multiple results for the same place right? when you search for New York City, which is terribly useful. Because um, remember, we're trying to come up with an authoritative reference for each of the, every geographic place in the world. And so we want to be able to bring these together. Uh, it's tricky to get right. We have a bunch of distance measures we can work with, like uh, geographic distance between any two records in the database, uh, along with text to difference, like how similar are the names. Uh, there's a measure called edit distance, where we can say, uh, how, how many characters do you have to change in order to turn one name into another? Um, but because places have alternate names, we actually have to compute the edit distance between the cross product of all of the names between two places. Um, and then there's place type, right? Oftentimes, uh, two different places from two different data sets will have the same place type, like uh, New York City is a city, right? But then uh, oftentimes, we'll have like a, a, a school in uh, OpenStreetMap is listed simply as a building in, uh, in GeoNames or vice versa. And so uh, even like we can't even necessarily rely on place type to be consistent across data sets. Uh, this is a problem where actually machine learning would really help um, because we can kind of take all of these different measures and just pour them into uh, an algorithm that sort of learns what are the relevant parameters uh, for deciding when two places really are the same. Um, but uh, in the meantime, we're relying on a much, and that's a, that, that again is a dissertation, right? Like the entire like, process of how do you, the question of how do you conflate geographic places across data sets is literally, it's a doctoral dissertation for someone. Um, but in the meantime, so we're relying on a much simpler algorithm. Uh, but fortunately, edit history lets us undo the robot's mistakes. So um, the library staff, part of being able to curate this data set is being able to say like, oh no, that automated conflation decision was wrong. Like this school is not the same as this fire station in spite of the fact that they're across the street from each other. So they're very close, similar names, different places. And so a human being can make that discrimination where a robot can't. Um, we also have the problem of search ranking. As you can see, we're still tweaking the search, the search result ranking. Uh, we have the full text. Basically, we're relying on the full text search uh, that comes back from Elasticsearch, and it's quite good. But there are other criteria by which we want to sort the places that come back for a search. Like intuitively, if you search for New York City, you don't want like uh, the the you know transit history museum of New York City to be your top result, right? You want the city of New York. Um, so, so how do we do that? Like, is, uh, we can use distance from search center. Uh, we can look at the place type. Maybe some place types are more important than others. Uh, if we know the populations of places, which for the most part we don't, um, we could use that. But there isn't actually a really good uh, open population database that we can rely on for this. Uh, there are some, like, uh, um, but we would have to conflate them. So that, that's a problem on itself. Um, the, the best solution I've seen for this is Matt Biddle's hack using Wikipedia request logs as a proxy for importance. So uh, Wikipedia publishes all of its uh, request logs. So you can download and see all of the things that have been requested from Wikipedia over a certain amount of time. This is a huge amount of data. So he used Hadoop to just find the requests for geographic places, like Wikipedia pages that correspond to geographic places, and then counted them per place. Right? This is a kind of classic use for a MapReduce algorithm. Um, and and then use those counts as a proxy for how important a place is, right? How often it, does it get searched for on Wikipedia? That's how important it is. Uh, so we're planning on doing a little bit of experimentation with a method like this as a way of kind of uh, flagging up the more important places in our database in order to surface them in the search results. Uh, there's some other challenges. As you know, we're, uh, we are conflating data sets that have disparate licenses. Um, uh, to, to address that directly, uh, it is uh, as members of the OpenStreetMap community, it is our intention to respect both the letter of the law and the intentions of the OpenStreetMap community. Uh, the Library of Congress will be making this the service that backs this gazetteer public. So you will be able to download the work, the curatorial work of the librarians and the robots that serve the librarians. 
Um, is that good enough? I mean, I don't know, right? Uh, we're hoping that that'll be good enough. There's also the question of synchronizing changes up and downstream, right? And you have this problem that you get with like, you almost want something like Git or GeoGit, uh, where, you know, if we make a change here and then GeoNames makes a change over there, like how do we both pull down the latest version from GeoNames but then apply the changes that the library has already made, right? This problem is solved in source code repositories, but um, I think at least until OpenGeo got their hands on the problem, nobody had really solved that for geographic information. Um, and unfortunately, I'm... I'm going to miss Jeff's talk, but you guys should go to that if you're interested. Um, and then there's a question of public participation, right? Um, is this a cathedral or is it a bazaar, right? Does the Library of Congress want the public to help curate their list of places or do they want to keep it in-house and, and make it kind of a little bit more controlled, right? And get less, uh, less kind of volume of improvement, but a higher quality of improvement. Right, and obviously with OSM we've gone the other way and we've said like, we want anybody to be able to edit this. But it's not always clear that that's the best use case for everyone. Um, and and the, the libraries, libraries tend to have this idea of like very careful curation. They spend a long time thinking about data and thinking about collections of data and how to perfect them. And, uh, and of course this brings us to the question is, is data ever truly perfectable? Um, and I think in, in the OSM community we know the answer to that. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you very much for your time. Let me ask, are there questions? I've, oh, please go ahead. Okay, that's a, that's a fantastic question, actually. I probably should have touched on that. So the question is, uh, when, when you have a place that has an indeterminate location, uh, how do you deal with it? Um, and we actually developed uh, the... Uh, the concept of a composite relation uh, in in the uh, library's gazetteer, where uh, we can define a new, we can create a new place that is defined as the union of a set of existing places, right? Uh, I mean, we also have editing tools and stuff where if we want library could librarian could like trace out a new place using uh, using uh, vector editing tools, but they're they're actually not so excited about that. For the American South, we would say, well, the South is the union of Virginia and North Carolina and South Carolina and so on. Um, and by bringing all those places together, we take the union of their geometry, and that's how we define the American South. If you have a place that can't be described, uh, a kind of a notional place that can't be described at least as the composite of a bunch of named places, then uh, you got to draw it with vector tools. Uh, it's a good question, though. Um, any others? I saw one in the back. Okay, two more. Uh, go ahead. Uh, oh, yeah, also good questions. Okay, so uh, we, uh, the, the, the JSON API will be available uh, on a kind of a, at least on a read-only basis, if not a read-write basis. Um, we have not talked about making data dumps available, but I suppose we could. I mean, there's no reason why not. We should look into that. Um, and then the code, of course, will be on GitHub, which is why there's a GitHub link there. We have not actually posted it yet. Uh, we're still kind of working on that process with the library, but it is, it is understood by all parties uh, that this is an meant to be an open source project and that the code will be available at the conclusion, at least before the conclusion of our work with them. Jeff. We have not. We, we, okay, so the question was, um, are we going back and using some of the original data sets that... Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so the question actually was, have we talked to the U.S. Geological Survey or to uh, NGA about, um, about them being able to make use of the Gazetteer as a resource for their own geographic databases? Do I have that right? Uh, uh, that's a great idea as far as I'm concerned. Um, you know, uh, of being able to, um, I mean, basically the answer is sort of, you know, can, or the, the corollary question is, can we get other federal agencies to, to talk to the Library of Congress, um, both on a kind of a political and technical basis, and get them to start sharing uh, that level of geographic data on, a, on an ongoing, in an ongoing way? Um, I think that's fantastic. Um, as outside consultants, we're not really in charge of that kind of thing, but I would be happy to try to encourage them to do so. Um, I think it would be fantastic to see our tax dollars being used more efficiently. So, yeah, and the Library of Congress is, I mean, it's the Library of Congress, but in some ways it's, you know, it's, it's one of the authoritative libraries in our country, and we have this sort of aspiration that the libraries, 
digital gazetteer will be uh, will become a resource for the public. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, keep an eye on GitHub. We'll be posting the code within a few weeks. I'm sorry we don't have it up there already. Um, but yeah, you've been great. Um, and uh, cheers.